The story of the relationship between the Jewish and black communities in America is complex, with periods of division, harmony, hostility, suspicion, and apathy. What are the historical roots of both the cooperation and conflict we see between these two communities today? And how do we create a vision for a brighter future? In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, Jewish opinions on slavery were in line with their white neighbors. As the politics of the U.S. shifted, Northern Jews increasingly opposed slavery, while Southern Jews continued to be sympathetic to slave ownership, though there were notable exceptions. These included Rabbi David Einhorn, who, in 1861, gave an anti-slavery sermon. His congregation erupted in anger, and the rabbi was forced to flee to the North. In the early 20th century, the Jewish community's demographics and opinions began to shift. Jews migrating from hostile countries settled in northeastern American cities where they encountered black Southerners fleeing Jim Crow laws and other forms of extreme racism. Coming from anti-Semitic Europe, many Jews recognized and drew attention to the parallels in the black and Jewish experience. Some Yiddish newspapers referred to violent attacks on black Americans, like the Tulsa Massacre, as pogroms. However, even with these positive developments, division remained between black and Jewish Americans. Both groups were lightning rods for other people's hatred, and many Jews who aspired to assimilate or just make a living were afraid of associating too much with a group so openly mistreated. This distance remained until the 1930s, when the rise of the Nazi party in Germany paralleled an increase in anti-Semitism in the US. Fearful and in need of allies, Jewish Americans sought support, and the black community was one of the few to join their cause. Black and Jewish organizations began working together to challenge employment and housing discrimination, combat racial and religious violence, and fight for inclusion in social and professional spheres. In the years following the Second World War, the bond between the communities grew. Jews made up at least 30% of non-black freedom riders, risking arrest and violence for black solidarity. Jewish lawyers battled Jim Crow laws, while black organizations like the NAACP, whose founders included Jews, supported the creation of the the state of Israel. Black and Jewish Americans, along with other minorities, led the effort to desegregate medical associations, southern universities, businesses, and community activities while working to introduce social programs for the benefit of all members of society. While southern Jewish support for segregation dwindled, the community was still torn over how to respond. Southern Jews faced pressure from their northern counterparts to condemn segregation, but they feared that making official statements against segregation would result in retribution from their white neighbors. Others argued that the community need not make official statements about a topic that didn't directly relate to the Jewish community. As a result, some southern Jewish institutions withdrew their support for national Jewish organizations that came out publicly against segregation. The growing northern Jewish population did not share the concerns of their southern counterparts. Iconic photos of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marching alongside the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. encapsulates the best of the black Jewish relationship at the time, often called the golden period between the two communities. Rabbi Joachim Prince, who devoted much of his life to the American Civil Rights Movement, spoke just before MLK took the podium in DC to deliver his famous I Have a Dream speech. Black and Jewish Americans continued the fight for civil rights during the 1964 Freedom Summer Project in Mississippi, where Jewish activists joined others helping register black voters and joined protests in front of courthouses. In June 1964, James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman were abducted and murdered for their fight for equal voting rights. The ensuing outrage pushed Lyndon Johnson to sign the Civil Rights Act the following month. While Jews still faced discrimination in the 1960s, the ability for many Jews to pass as white still set them apart from their black peers. Jews had relatively greater access to education and finances, giving them more class mobility. These opportunities, combined in some part with the healthy bonds between the communities, enabled Jews to open businesses and buy property in predominantly black areas, a degree of coexistence that sowed the seeds of discord. A Jew was now their boss, their landlord, or their creditor, playing into age-old anti-Semitic tropes. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, the bonds between the Jewish and black communities strained under growing racial tensions in urban America. Atlanta's first Jewish mayor employed racist rhetoric in his re-election campaign against black challenger Maynard Jackson. In 1984, presidential hopeful Jesse Jackson made a number of anti-Semitic comments, referring to Jews as Jaimes. The growth and increased visibility of the anti-Semitic Nation of Islam didn't help matters. 
As the Israeli-Palestinian conflict drew greater international attention, division between the communities mounted as Palestinians were increasingly seen as people of color, with Jews seen as white oppressors. And while many in both communities continued to cherish the golden period of the 50s and 60s, others began to portray Jewish support for civil rights as paternalistic and therefore just another form of racism. Tensions seemed to come to a climax in the 1991 Crown Heights riots, which erupted after a Hasidic man accidentally veered his car onto a sidewalk, killing seven-year-old Gavin Cato. The next day, in retaliation, 29-year-old Yankel Rosenbaum was stabbed and beaten by a group of black men. Rosenbaum died a few hours later from his wounds. Over the next three days, rioters looted stores and damaged Jewish property. The violence of the Crown Heights riots touched a nerve. For some, the pain, mistrust, and anger continues to this day. More recently, old wounds were reopened when voices within movements like Black Lives Matter and the Women's March made anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist remarks. In 2019, extremists connected to the Black Hebrew Israelite movement were responsible for the murder of four people, including two Jews, at a Jersey City synagogue and kosher supermarket. For some, these are simply isolated incidents. For others, this violence points to a broader, unacknowledged anti-Semitism reflected in Anti-Defamation League polls that find Black Americans are significantly more likely than white Americans to accept anti-Semitic stereotypes. Despite these ongoing tensions, the communities continue to find common ground. A shared sense of fear and urgency after the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville alarmed both communities and triggered a rise in collaboration between some Jewish and Black organizers and activists. In 2019, the late John Lewis, along with congressional representatives, formed the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus on Black-Jewish Relations, which now consists of 55 members. Today's efforts at cooperation always fall under the shadow cast by the traumas of racism and anti-Semitism, pain and mistrust. But there is tremendous hope. One year after the Jersey City murders, members of both communities say the violence has forced them to leave their respective bubbles and confront difficult issues together, a model relevant well beyond Jersey City. As Pamela Johnson of the Jersey City Anti-Violence Coalition Movement said, we may not have always understood each other, but we are all in this together.